So what I want to do is remember, as we, as we look at these books, as we're studying through them, uh, the Lord's plan of redemption through the Bible. Okay, the whole thing we're looking at is the plan of redemption. Last week, Ben covered in 2 Samuel chapter 7, there was a covenant made with David. In verse 16, the Lord said, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That was a promise given to David. And we go back to even think of Genesis 12, when Abram was called out of the earth of the Chaldees, and he was said, in that, in that, those promises in chapter 12 that all peoples or all families on earth will be blessed through you. And we dimly get to see now, looking, at, looking back at it, what he was speaking of. Chapters 15 and 17, the covenant, that this will be your land, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And then Jacob, in his final speech before he uh, passes with his sons in Genesis 49 to the tribe of Judah, his son, he said, the scepter will not depart from you, or the ruler's staff from between your feet. So it was a prophecy. Looking forward down the road to the one who would come in the line of David, we know that to be Jesus Christ. But originally, as we look at the book of 1 Kings, just like 1 and 2 Samuel, it used to be one book. And then when they translated it from Greek to Septuagint, it was so long, the Greek is so long, they made it two books, 1 and 2 Kings. Um, the author officially is unknown. Jewish tradition has Jeremiah as the author. In fact, the Talmud said uh, Jeremiah wrote his own book, the Book of Kings and the Book of Lamentations. And that would kind of be right because uh, First and Second Kings records the history then, starting with the transition of the monarchy from David to Solomon, which we'll see today, First Kings chapter 1, as that begins, and ends in Second Kings 25 with their destruction, the captivity to Babylon, the exile to Babylon in 2 Kings 25. So that covers those two books. So most historians believe that the book of Kings was written during the Babylonian captivity. And that happened, it ended about 538, and there's no mention of that in the book of Kings, so it probably was written around 550. And Jeremiah would have been, uh, would have been in that time period, Jeremiah could have been the author. So this book of 1 Kings was completed probably by 550 B.C. Just to give you a, a, a little idea of the time period we're looking at. Uh, there's also mention, if you like 1 Kings 14, it mentions some other books uh, that we don't have, that some historical uh, materials and writings, such as the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Israel and the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. You'll see that written in there. And we don't know, we don't have those manuscripts, but it was useful for the author if he refers to those. Okay? So as we look at that, uh, the book of 1 Kings, and I want to break it into and just outline for him, we have three main headings, okay? The first would be chapters 1 through 11, the reign of Solomon, the reign of King Solomon. So chapters 1 to 4, Solomon's established as David's rightful successor. Chapters 5 through 10, the major accomplishments of Solomon. And then chapter 11, Solomon's spiritual and political decline. Uh, and then the second part of the outline would be chapters 12 to 16, the early divided kingdom, so the northern tribes secede, and there's a reason for that. We'll go into that a little bit. Um, that's chapters 12, and then Jeroboam, who becomes the first king of the northern kingdom, known as Israel or Samaria, uh, chapters 12 to 14, and then Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who's king in Judah, and then all the way to Ahab, the wicked king of Israel. That's like chapters 14 to 16, so in that range. So now what happens, 14 to 16, basically a back and forth, looking at these kings, good kings, bad kings, little, little hint, uh, if you've not been through this, all the kings of Israel are called bad, the northern kingdom. They're all bad. Some worse than others, and we'll, we'll talk about that for a second. In Judah, there's some that are called good and some that are called bad, but David is used as a standard by which they're judged. David is the, is the standard of goodness that all the kings of Judah are judged. All right? In the northern kingdom, it's Jeroboam of Nebat, the son of Nebat, who's used, you'll see, he did all the things that Jeroboam did. It talks about all those bad kings. So he's the standard of evil and wickedness that's used to judge these kings. And then the third part of the, of the outline, so we had the reign of Solomon, the early divided kingdom, and then from chapter 17 to the end, we call that uh, prophets, and kings, prophets and kings. So chapter 17, 
one of my favorites, Elijah, comes into play. Elijah comes on the scene, the great prophet of God. He uh, challenges the prophets of Baal, defeats them. We'll look at that a little bit. Ahab and Jezebel, in chapter 21, they have this wicked thing they did for a man named Naboth, where they seized his vineyard and had him murdered. And then at the end, um, in chapter 22, a prophet named Micaiah pronounced judgment against Ahab. And then at the end of chapter 22, King Ahab, as prophesied, is killed in battle. Okay. So with that as an outline, going through all these different kings, I just want to pull out some major events as we'd like to do and see how that fits into the timeline and into God's plan of redemption. Because there's some things here that okay, you say, well, how can, this, how can God work through this? He looks and he works through sinful people. Uh, we want to take a little closer look at David and Solomon. Okay, and so chapters one and two, the kingship is passing from David to Solomon. He's an old man, and it opens up. It's it's an interesting story. It opens up in chapter one and say, you know, David's old and he can't stay warm, and so they find a beautiful young woman to keep him warm. And it says there's no relationship with him, but he has a woman that would just hold him and keep him warm. I thought, well, that's interesting perspective. Uh, but they find this beautiful young woman that comes to play here a little bit with his son Adonijah. And then we look at Solomon and say, well, how, of all the sons, why was Solomon the one that was to be the next king? And we find that really in the book of 1 Chronicles. So if you go to 1 Chronicles, I'll just read this for you. In, in chapter 22, it says, uh, Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood have waged great wars, you shall not build a house to my name, because you've shed so much blood before me. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all the surrounding enemies, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give him peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father. And here's what it says, I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. So that's how we know Solomon then was to be heir to the throne, not the other brothers. And so um, we look at Solomon then. There's a son named Adonijah who had set himself up to be king, but that was not how it was supposed to be. And so we have this little bit of an attempt at a coup here to take over the kingship, and uh, they find out about it. We can't go into all the detail. You can read this at your own time, but basically what happens is David ends up getting revenge on his enemies. He didn't do it, but he had Solomon do it. So the son, Adonijah, um, said, okay, Solomon's king, but please, can I have that woman that kept my father warm? Can I have her to be my wife? And that infuriates Solomon. And Adonijah goes into the temple, and he's holding on to the horns of the altar, which is a sign of, uh, he's asking for mercy. And Solomon said, no, and he went down and had him struck. So Adonijah is out of the picture. Um, Joab, the military leader, I know Ben talked about him last week. He was wicked. He has him killed. And then Shimei, who was the man who cursed David when he was running from his son Absalom and fled. And Shimei, the whole thing that happens there, but Shimei ends up in the end. He's dead too. So all the enemies of David and Solomon then is able to take the throne uh, in peace. And what do I want to do? Just a little bypass here for a moment is to look I quoted Edmund Clowney before and there's a little excerpt here up, please. what's that? can you hold that book up? yes, Edmund Clowney okay. it's called uh, The Unfolding Mystery Discovering Christ in the Old Testament and this little, little snippet I wanted to read for you looking at David and Solomon uh, really as types of Christ and he says David foreshadows the long suffering restraints of Christ's humiliation Solomon typifies Christ as the judge who ushers in the kingdom by judging justly. Christ's rule as the Prince of Peace is grounded in the perfect justice of his judgment. The fulfillment is, of course, far richer than the foreshadowing. We cannot simply take David to be the type of Christ's first coming and King Solomon to be his second. Nevertheless, the marked contrast between David and Solomon helps us recognize the contrast between the humiliation and exaltation of Christ, his long-suffering grace, and his final justice. So that, in the background, if you look at David and Solomon, you, you kind of see this shadowy picture of Christ because Christ comes from the line of David. 
All right, so we see that. A um, little biblical perspective then on David and Solomon. Chapters 3 and 4, right off the bat it says that Solomon got a wife from Egypt. Why? <laughs> you want to find out Solomon liked his women. All right, that's one of his downfalls. He gets a wife from Egypt, but then he prays for wisdom, and God honors that. In that chapter, uh, in, in 3 and 4, we see he prays for wisdom from God, and God delivers because of his father, David. Remember, he's much blessed because of David. He's the standard by which all these kings of Judah are judged. And so we're told he has tremendous blessing of wisdom, a tremendous blessing of wealth. And in chapters 5 through 7, a very key event, as it was prophesied and told about in First Chronicles, Solomon begins and makes plans to build a temple, and Hiram, the king of uh, Sidon, retire, uh, helps him. He gets all this cedar and gold. I wanted to read a portion uh, just about the Holy of Holies. I mean, it goes in intimate detail about the craftsmanship and the engineering and the beauty of this temple. It was magnificent. So in uh, chapter 6, verses 19, starting at verse 19, listen to the, 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 what was done here just in the Holy of Holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant would dwell. It says, the inner sanctuary he prepared in the innermost part of the house to set there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide. So we're talking 30 feet, 10 yards. Think about a football field. Um, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. He overlaid an altar of cedar. And Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold. And he drew chains of gold across in front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. And he overlaid the house with gold until all the house was finished. And the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. And then he talks about the cherubim that sat on the mercy seat. And their wings spanned 15 feet each. And so they went from one end of the wall to the other over the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, where God was to dwell. And he said, he put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house. And the wings of the cherubim were spread out so the wing of one touched the one wall. And the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall. And their other wing touched each other in the middle of the house, and he overlaid the cherubim with gold. Fantastic. <clears throat> to have that much gold. It took seven years to construct the temple. But then we're told on the very next portion, it says that he built his own house. It took 13 years to build his own house. Tell you a little bit something about Solomon, okay? Seven years to build God's temple, 13 years. I wrote, I just put, hmm, I just, something to consider. 13 years to go to his own house. Chapters 8 and 9 then, this magnificent temple then is dedicated. And there's, there's prayer and there's offerings and there's sacrifices going on. And in chapter 8, 55, it says this. He stood and blessed all the assembly. This is Solomon. And said with a loud voice, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people, Israel, according to all they promised. Listen to what he's, he's, he's praying these promises back to God. He says, Not one word has failed of all his good promises, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. The Lord our God will be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments he commanded our fathers. Let these words of mine which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires. And then he goes on to say, Let your heart therefore be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. And the Lord likes that. The Lord comes in chapter 9. And we see verses 4 to 7. The Lord appears to Solomon. Beginning of verse 4 of chapter 9. He says, As for you, if you walk before me, if, if you walk before me, as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all I've commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you turn aside from following me, or if you're children and do not keep my commandments, and my statutes that I have set before you. But go and serve other gods and worship them. I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them. And the house I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. So 
There's that promise like we hear from Moses in Deuteronomy. The blessings and curses. All right? If you do this, you'll be blessed. If not, God then will bring a downfall. Again, this is what's coming. Okay? He's, he's setting the mind. God knows everything. He's got the complete foreknowledge. So, what happens here with Solomon? His wisdom, his wealth, his, his greatness is known throughout all the land, all the known world. And he attracts attention. Uh, I mean, the, the guy with knowledge, of it, he, he used to teach, he taught science, he taught biology, he taught all kinds of things. He, people would sit and come and listen to him teach. And he gets attraction uh, from a woman known as the Queen of Sheba. And I think we believe Sheba to be somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, perhaps Yemen. So she came a long way. And in chapter 10, the Queen of Sheba comes. And she, uh, she says this. She said, when she looks at all the abundance of Solomon, basically she couldn't believe it, so she had to come and look for herself. The report was true, but I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. I did not believe the reports until I came with my own eyes and had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. In other words, you're greater than even I heard. And she says, your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Isn't that great? Woman coming to... She's not, a, she's not a believer, but she becomes impressed with what Solomon has done. And then, the very next chapter, we begin to see this downfall. And we're told that uh, Solomon loved his women. 700 wives, 300 concubines. If my math is correct, that's 1,000. I, I don't know how you keep track of that. How do you even do that? But what happens is what, what God had told them, if you turn to the right to the left, away from me, there will be consequences. And lo and behold, he begins to worship Molech and Chemosh and uh, the Baals, and his heart is turned from the Lord. And it's really sad. Uh, chapter 11, just reading a few of these. The Lord was angry with Solomon, it says in verse 9 of chapter 11. His heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did it anyway. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. But he said, because of David, I won't do it right now. It'll happen with your son. All right, so David, again, because of David, he's the standard. This, this, this cursing that takes place will take place with his son and not with him. Okay? So we read then, Solomon dies. And here comes the divided kingdom. Remember God, he desires obedience and faithfulness and devotion from his people. And we heard that back in Deuteronomy with Moses before they crossed into the promised land. This is what you need to do. And now we see leadership is failing you know, David, the man, the, the man after God's own heart, he's the standard. Solomon, great wealth, great wisdom, but he had some flaws. We can see those character flaws in it. And he dies. And now we have chapters 11 and 12. Uh, his son Rehoboam begins to reign. And Rehoboam's kind of foolish. And uh, long story short, he ends up telling the people who come to him saying, you know, we hope that you're going to be kind to us. And he says, no, I'm going to be harder on you than my dad was. I'm going to make you work harder. I'm going to tax you higher than my father did. And so there's a split in the kingdom. And it had been prophesied through a prophet named Ahijah that uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, then would take ten tribes and they would separate and become the northern kingdom, known as Israel or Samaria. And he said, I will leave one kingdom for the sake of David, I will leave one kingdom for his son. And uh, he says, though he will always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem. Right? Again, David saves things as they should be. The ten northern tribes become Israel. The two main tribes, Judah and also Benjamin, then become known as Judah. And so 
when you're reading Kings, you're reading Chronicles, the northern kingdom, that's what we're talking about. This has been a, there's a split now between these two kingdoms. Jeroboam then immediately goes into apostasy. He says, you know, if people go back to Jerusalem to worship, they're going to go back to Rehoboam and forget about me. So he, he sets up golden calves of all things. Does that sound familiar? He takes golden calves, he puts them in Bethel and Dan. So he makes two places. Dan's up north, and he makes two places where they can go and to worship. So they don't have to go to Jerusalem. And he appoints priests. Just whoever, you'll be a priest for me, you'll be a priest for me, not Levites. And he makes up feasts and festivals for the people to celebrate. He just, goes, he just kind of makes his own thing there. And so it's just apostasy. And we see then every, every king that came after Jeroboam is wicked. Because they don't know the true God. They don't know the promises of God. They don't know the covenants of God. See what happens? When we get just one generation away, things start unraveling tremendously. Chapters 14 to 16 then deal with the various kings who reigned. And so basically um, all Israel's kings are pretty much wicked. They're evil. That leads us to the most, the most wicked of all. If you look, if, if you were to rate these kings of Israel, the most wicked of all would be Ahab and his wife Jezebel. You, you don't ever want to be called a Jezebel. <laughs> That's not a good name to be known by. It's a bad name. In fact, Jezebel's father was named Eph Baal. He had Baal in his name. And he was the king of the Sidonians, king of Sidon. So that takes us through the first 16 chapters. We have this divided kingdom. And we have Jeroboam up north, Rehoboam in the south. And as it goes on and progresses, now we come to King Ahab. There's such wickedness that the prophet Elijah comes on the scene. Chapter 17. Elijah, uh, which means my God is Yahweh. That's what his name means. My God is Yahweh. He declares a drought to Ahab. Ends up lasting over three years. A lot, of, a lot of suffering. Remember we talked about when we looked at Ruth. That when there's a drought, it usually means God's judgment. And this is deep, indeed God's judgment for their, their sin and disobedience. But Elijah was cared for by ravens. And then he was sent to a, a, a widow in Gentile territory. And he performed some great miracles. Including raising her son from the dead. And so Elijah is that, is that great prophet who um, is filled with the Spirit of God. He's very bold, and he also can back it up. And so we see Elijah and Elisha, the great prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, he confronts Ahab, and he challenges the prophets of Baal to basically to a duel. You know that where they built the altars, all right? And the prophets of Baal build their altar, and they put the, the bull on there. And their, the deal was whoever could... Make their God light the altar would be the true God. And so he lets them go first. And it's kind of humorous. And all these prophets, there's 400 of them. 400 of them. And they're all dancing around all day long. And they're cutting themselves and chanting. And, you know, Elijah gets a little jab in there and said, Cry a little louder, we can't hear you. Or maybe he's relieving himself. Or maybe he's on vacation, whatever. And nothing ever happens. He said, Okay, it's my turn. So he goes out and he builds up the altar. They had torn down the altar to God. And he says, pour water on it. Pour more water on it. And then, of course, he prays and God's come down. And, and he said he even lift up all, consumed the sacrifice, lift up all the water. And the people said, oh, this is the prophet of God. And so he takes and he has all those many, many prophets of Baal killed. It's the end of them. It infuriates Jezebel because those were her buddies. And Jezebel said, you know what? Um, Far be it for me if, if you're not like those prophets by this time tomorrow. And so Elijah becomes public enemy number one. He's on the run. He's fearful of what Jezebel said. They're after him. He's also depressed. He thinks he's about the only prophet left. And so he flees down to Beersheba. If you remember, that's where Abraham had spent some time. And then he goes all the way to Sinai. And here we get a little comparison. We think about Moses at Sinai. And now Elijah is at Mount Sinai. And what happens? He says there's an there's a, a, a appearance of wind and storm and fire. And we think up on the mountain of Sinai, what do we have before the law was given? Remember, there, there was like an earthquake and there was wind and there was smoke and there was fire. And God then appears to Elijah. And you remember Moses, he held him up. He's put him in the cleft of the rock and basically 
if he, if he had a hand, he said he put his hand over him so he could just see my backside. And Elijah goes, covers his face. He wraps up his face and goes before the Lord. And the Lord speaks to him and says, you know, why are you here? I've got 7,000 prophets who have not bowed to Baal. And so then he empowers him, refreshes him, and he gives him three things to do. He says, I want you to go back. And he said, I want you to anoint Hazael to be king of Syria. That was an enemy of, of the northern kingdom. I want you to anoint Jehu to be the king of Israel. And I want you to anoint Elisha to replace you as prophet. And those three things come to play when we look at 2 Kings next week. Those three men play roles in what we're going to talk about next week. All right? Chapter 20 then. Ahab fighting against the Syrians. Ben-Hadad is their current king. And he defeats him not once but twice in battle. Yes, Ahab had some victories in battle. He was still wicked. But he was blessed to have these victories. But then what he did is kind of like a move that King Saul did. He didn't destroy the king. Instead, he made an alliance with him. He became friends with the enemy and made an alliance with him. And he was condemned by a prophet for doing that. And his life shall be taken in battle. And we'll get to the end and we'll see that's what happened. And then interspersed in chapter 21, next to the last chapter, is a sad story of a man named Naboth. This is, I think, put in there to show you the wickedness of these two, Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab wanted this vineyard. It was next to where he lived, and this man had this vineyard. He'd inherited it from his family. He worked it. It was beautiful property. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't even sell it to Ahab. So Ahab's upset. He's in his bedroom just sulking. And Jezebel says, what's the matter with you? He goes, he won't, let, he won't sell me his vineyard. He goes, I'll take care of things. And so they devise a scheme and have this Naboth, who's a, a, a good man, he comes out and they accuse him of blasphemy and they have him stoned to death. You can read about that in chapter 21. It's phenomenal. And so they go and take his property. Elijah then is sent. Elijah is sent with the word against him. It says, Elijah condemns Ahab and Jezebel in chapter 21, verses 4 to 10. I'm sorry, 20 to 24. Listen to what happens here. This is Elijah again. The Lord came to him and said, you need to go talk to this guy. This is really getting out of hand. And in chapter 21, verses 20 to 24, Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I found you because you sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. See, that's the standard of wickedness. Like the house of Vasha, the son of Ahijah, who was Jeroboam's son. For the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of heaven shall eat. That's not good to have that said about you. That's not good at all. Ahab does repent, and the Lord postpones judgment just for a generation. It comes upon his son later. So finally in chapter 22, we have this story where Ahab becomes friends with Jehoshaphat, who's the king of Judah, and he persuades him to go into battle with him against Ramoth Gilead, which is east of the Jordan. And, you know, Ahab has 400 prophets. 400 prophets who are yes men, basically. Whatever he wants, they'll prophesy that. Okay? And so he asked him, he said, uh, shall we go into battle? Jehoshaphat wanted to know, what does the Lord say? And the 400 said, oh yeah, yeah, go and the Lord will give you victory. And Jehoshaphat's kind of... Uh, He's kind of suspicious that all 400 would agree. And he says, is there anybody else who can prophesy for me? Ahab says, yeah, there's this prophet. His name's Micaiah, but he always is against me. I don't really want, yeah. He says, well, let's hear from him. So Micaiah comes, and he says, um, he says, this is what Micaiah says. First of all, he agrees with him. And then they said, now tell us what the Lord really said. He goes, well, I had a vision. And in my dream, I saw the Lord send out lying spirits into these 400 prophets of Ahab to deceive him. And Ahab then has Micaiah arrested and held in prison. In the last words of Micaiah, he says, 
to Ahab, if you return in peace from this battle, the Lord has not spoken by me. All right? So what's the mark of a true prophet? It's when his prophecy comes true. That's how you know he's a true prophet. And so we're told then in this battle, which Ahab does something kind of sneaky. He, uh, he wants to go into battle, so he has Jehoshaphat to go out and dress like a king because, no, they're going to be after Ahab. So he says, Jehoshaphat, you go out and dress like a king, and I'm going to disguise myself as a regular soldier. So he <laughs> said, if they're going to kill anybody, it's going to be Jehoshaphat. Well, they realize he's not Ahab, and they turn, and it just says, as the Lord would have it in his providence, that a man shot a random arrow, and it struck Ahab through his armor, and he dies. Just a random arrow. Nothing's random in God's kingdom. And then first king, Ahab dies. Jezebel is dealt with later. We'll look at her next week. But first Kings, end, first Kings ends with, it's kind of a strange break here. Um, at the end, we have a little piece on Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and then on uh, Ahab's son, Ahaziah, as king of Israel. Okay, That's how it ends in chapter 22. So, what you want to think of, despite the sin and the evil and the wickedness of men, God shows us he's in total sovereign control of all events and all actions and all outcomes. Nothing takes him by surprise. It's all for his glory alone. The moral failure of these human kings in Israel point us to the one true king who's going to be on the scene. He's prophesied even here. We see it through David. The one from the tribe of Judah. The one who will be the redeemer of all those who humble themselves to his lordship and put their faith and trust in what he accomplished at Calvary. So all these, as we look through these wicked kings and we look at these activities, it should make us focus and long for the one who will come from the tribe of Judah. That will be the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That's how 1 Kings ends. So next we can look at 2 Kings a little bit more from Elijah, and then we have Elisha, who has something in common with me. All right, so does anybody have any questions or comments?